I can notice and I'm willing to let go of the moral superiority thinking I'm right, the other person's wrong. Where I'm trying to practice now is admitting to myself or acknowledging that I'm actually scared. So when I let, if I let go of the defenses and the pointing the finger at others, then I, then I must feel my own pain. I must feel my own sadness or insecurity. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the State of Mind podcast, where we create conversations about mental health that change lives. Through these discussions, we hope you find meaning and encouragement to cultivate your innate capacity for resilience and well-being. My name is Mike Stroh. I'm a psychotherapist and the founder of Starts With Me, a consultancy that specializes in K-12 education and workplace mental health. Hi, Tony. We're, we are back with the next part. I don't know even want to say part two because this may be many parts, but we left off last time toward the end of step five and just started discussing step six. And one thing I remember you mentioned to me, however, I don't know, a handful of years ago, when doing the or having these type of conversations you said something along the lines of it's sacred or there's something and i don't know other words to use but i guess religious words seem to be the only ones available but there is something sacred about these conversations and about talking about these things and so hopefully people who listen to the first one if you did not, I encourage you to do so prior to listening to this, although I'm sure you'll be able to follow along if not. So we are going to start, I guess, with step six. So maybe I should read that. So step six is we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Maybe, Tony, do you want to just start with your experience with step six thank you mike Uh, hi uh thanks for having me back Uh, i'm an alcoholic and addict in recovery my name is tony um i feel it's important to say that just get myself grounded uh it's my pleasure to to be here with you again and just sharing my experience and thank you for saying about the sacredness of this program and and what we do in the 12 steps and yes i do feel for me that that is really the most apropos word to describe the journey um so i take it really seriously i know this for my own experience to be a a life-saving and life-giving experience um and the honesty that is shared between a sponsor and sponsee or whoever's uh the mentor, uh, protege going through the experience and the safety that is, is unsued from this, I think is really important, you know, for the recovery process. So that's why I feel like it's important to keep, keep that level of safety and, you know, like for lack of a better word, sacredness of, of the program so that we can both experience the healing Because I know for me, uh, that didn't happen overnight. It was something that took a long time to to foster, even in this recovery, because I had so much trauma and uh, uh, an experience of not feeling safe in the world that for me to just to be engaged and to really move into the process, it really took a long, long time you know, for me to, to grab hold of and, and to really trust. Um, and I'm still going through it. Like I, my sobriety date is August 1st, 1998. I've been through the steps, you know, several times. Um, my experience with steps six and seven, I kind of lumped them together. It, today is quite different than originally when I first went through them. 
I remember distinctly being so consumed with steps four and five and eight and nine that I really feel that I just kind of skirted through six and seven, not really even understanding what they were about. Um, spiritual principle of step six, as I understand it, is willingness. And um, the way that I experienced step six, uh, either on sort of the receiving end as a sponsor with a sponsee is pretty much out of the big book today, where we're asked after we, we do our step five, and we have disclosed all of this stuff and it admitted, admitted to myself for my first time, you know, what my wrongs are, um, and, you know, identifying what these shortcomings or defects of character are. The big book in this instruction asks me to return home for an hour and to reflect upon it. I did not do that the first time. I, I never really did the steps in the order or the way that the big book describes it to do. I didn't really know what I was doing. I had a sponsor and we kind of sort of just did it, you know, like we did a step four, then did step five. And then, mm -hmm. then after that, it was like, I don't even know that I did a step eight list where I wrote it down. Um, again, what I was more consume with was the going out and making amends so I don't know that I was really in the present moment of really absorbing what I had just done in step five to really reflect and take a time and really ponder over what these what I want to change about myself because I understand step six is the beginning like I think the whole process of steps four through nine is a process of change spiritual transformation but I think step six is really a key uh, action, you know, where I really take that time to really prepare myself to move forward with the process of step seven. And uh, an interesting exercise that I was shown through the mucking process, um, which is a process that is used in, in a lot of circles of um, various fellowships that I'm in where they kind of go and muck through but there's a language and there's a bunch of bunch of things that you do and one of the things that I was asked to do was to stand in front of the mirror and look at myself and to say to myself out loud and and list off all of my defects like and, and look myself in the eye and say it to myself because you know and I found that experience to be very a, a good one and I would encourage people to do it because um, I'm just so good at self-delusion and self-dishonesty and lying to myself and not really taking the time to really appreciate what I'm trying to do in step six um, was mentioned in uh, towards the end of our last session about the book drop the rock I really find that book particularly beneficial so when when and this is something I use with my sponsorship style today is when my sponsee has completed step five we then I ask them to go and do that reflection piece for an hour but then we read the book together drop the rock and just so it can really articulate and identify and bring to light well, I, I think a lot of what we don't really understand initially, because I don't know, for me, this stuff has been with me for such a long time. And, uh, and it was like difficult for me to really hone in on exactly what, what my defects of character really were, you know, um, you know, and so I, I find that book particularly helpful for that. Piece of it. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna on that note, I'm gonna just read a little bit from drop the rock. It's page 28 under step six. Step six requires us to stop struggling. It is time to acknowledge that we need help. Not only help to stop our addiction, but help in living better lives. Having gone through steps four and five, we become aware of our defects of character. Perhaps pride and thoughts of superiority are blocking the way to serenity. 
or it may be the habit of judging others. Perhaps it is a deep resentment, envy, or self-pity that keeps us in turmoil. It is good to read step six over and over. It is brief and to the point. All it requires is becoming ready to become willing. We don't have to achieve change immediately. We can work on our attitude of mind and pray about it. We can think it over and see that our lives can become more trouble-free when we rid ourselves of destructive habits. Step six tells us to relax. We don't do it all alone. Reflect. We turn to our higher power with confidence. Think of the relief that is waiting once we become entirely ready. It's like heading into a hot shower after working at a grubby chore. Feeling the dirt wash away is great. We emerge refreshed and shining and ready to deal with whatever comes our way. We affirm to our higher power that we are ready to have God remove our defects. We continue in close and loving contact with God while we do our part in working on our shortcomings. Once we allow room for God to work in our lives, we are making it possible for wonderful changes to take place. We become more in balance with right living principles. We all know individuals in recovery who have given up the booze or another addiction, yet they are staying dry or abstinent only by redirecting their intense inner misery into the lives of others. They won't work the sixth and seventh steps. One thing I would say about that process is, and you said it nicely too, once we become aware of all, all of our, or you know, as many of our shortcomings or defects of character, <laughs> letting go of them or noticing how we're holding on to them in different aspects of our life takes time, or it did take time for me. And I think it said there too, just the willingness to be willing. It, it's really about just the openness to the possibility that I don't need to behave like this anymore or that letting go of these things might be helpful. And I'll rem I remember one, the memory is so clear in my mind when I started to internalize this, I was washing dishes. It's probably seven, eight years ago or something. And I was stewing in resentment to, to my wife, <laughs> just stewing in this, I'm, I'm, I'm right, she's wrong. If she would just change, I would feel better. What's wrong with her? And it dawned on me that that was me holding on to my, some, well, a couple defect, a couple shortcomings a lack of or an inability to forgive, a sense of moral superiority, and almost an addiction to anger or something. So once we get rid of the substances, of course, we have all other kinds of quirks. And so that was really interesting when I started noticing more of those things. And I I've certainly come a long way, but I still get sucked into those patterns. What I notice now perhaps more is that I, I, can, I can notice and I'm willing to let go of the moral superiority, thinking I'm right, the other person's wrong. Where I'm trying to practice now is admitting to myself or acknowledging that I'm actually scared. So when I let, if I let go of the defenses and the pointing the finger at others, then I'm, then I must feel my own pain. I must feel my own sadness or insecurity. And, and that's where I'm practicing now is how can I be, just allow myself to feel scared or vulnerable and by doing that, I can then let go and forgive and ask for reconnection in some sense. Yeah, so I think that's part of where I am now. And then I just realized I could ask 
my higher power for help to do that, which is part of step seven, but we won't get too far ahead of that. So anyway, that was my little story on how step six, I think, is working for me right now. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, it's, uh, I just I'd like to read a, a little section yeah. uh, about step six out of the AA Big Book. It says, returning home, we find a place where we can be quiet for an hour, carefully reviewing what we have done. We thank God from the bottom of our heart that we know him better. Taking this book down from the shelf, our big book, we turn to the page which contains the 12 steps. Carefully reading the first five proposals, we ask if we have omitted anything, for we are building an arch through which we shall walk a free man at last. Is our work solid so far? Are the stones properly in place? Have we skimped on the cement put into the foundation? Have we tried to make mortar without sand? So like all that really reminds me is like, have I done my utmost and in, in honestly really surrendered all of this stuff in my fourth step out? You know, have I, have I done that or have I omitted anything? Have I kept some things for myself? Um, is there anything there that really, because I really feel it all needs to be out there and we need to share it all and bear it all as, as difficult and as humiliating it might feel at the time. I think it's really important that we do it. And so that's why it's asking, like, did we actually get it all there? You know, and it says, if we can answer to our satisfaction, then we look at step six. We have emphasized willingness as being indispensable. Are we now ready to let God remove all of us, the things which have admitted are objectionable? Can he now take them all, every one? If we still cling to something we will not let go, we ask God to help us be willing. You know, and so like steps, um, like in step six and seven, you know, they use the ideas of uh, defects of character and shortcomings. And I had some confusion around them. I used to think they were kind of the same thing. And I understand a little differently now that defects are the attitudes, behaviors, beliefs that I need to discard, that I need to, that are hurting me, they're blocking me, they're, they're no longer serving me, you know, and they've got to go. Um, and then the shortcomings are the things that I know I would be better off not having, but I'm not really there yet, or I'm still, you know, you mentioned about like, you know, pride. I know for me, that's, it's a big one. You know, I, I like to feel just a little superior to others, you know, I know this is a shortcoming of mine, but still sometimes you know, it, it's like, you know, it's a shortcoming because it, it, it's, it, you know, it's, it's kind of has to like, in a way it kind of serves, but in a way it doesn't, you know, it's, uh, it's something that um, I think people pick up on and it's, uh, it, it, it doesn't foster that trust you know, in, in me or others, you know, because they're going to pick up and they're going to, you know, I mean, for a long time, I thought I was supposed to show you what being recovered looked like. So, and that I didn't make any mistakes. That's what, it, that's how I interpreted it, that everything that I said and did was in the air of perfection, you know, without it, that I didn't make mistakes and I didn't, show you that either. Um, I was pretty careful at not allowing you to see that side of me because I thought I wasn't supposed to, you know? I thought I'm supposed to be an example and I'm only supposed to show you what recovery looks like, not the vulnerable parts of myself. And I have a completely different stance on that today that I think that it's even better for me to show the vulnerable parts of myself, to put my pride aside, to really let you see me, you know, 
because that's how you're going to feel safe and feel like at par with me as opposed to always feeling like you, I'm up there, uh, you know, and, and they're down here and it, it has this hierarchy, right? So I wish I'd have understood that a long time ago. You know, I, I didn't. Um, it's taken work in other recovery fellowships to help me understand that a little bit better. Yeah, so um, where I'm at today with that is really trying to just exercise that vulnerability. And I said it in my last talk is like showing you the warts, you know, <laughs> showing you the warts. That's the part that's uncomfortable for me to do, you know, and to, uh, to counteract that thinking that I'm supposed to look all together and appear like, you know, it's, I mean, I don't want to sit around and just like, be a martyr or you know morbid in in my sort of undertaking of that uh, don't get me wrong but i think it's also equally important to just show you like when i'm going through a rough period right you know yeah um how how have you seen other people perhaps or maybe that's a bit tricky because we're we don't want to do other people's inventory i guess but this this sense of i like how you distinguished the defects from the shortcomings so maybe i'll start that with that what i also would add to the shortcomings short coming shortcomings mm -hmm. is the areas of our life that are so for example i want to be quicker to forgive or i or i maybe it's i want to be able to let go of the resentments and the sense of i'm right you're wrong i'm good you're bad a little bit more quickly and my shortcoming in that respect is just the fact that I, I want to be more serene and more at peace. It's almost as if I'm, I'm, I'm it's a moving forward kind of thing. I, I want to be more <laughs> in the hands of the higher power, in the spirit of recovery or compassion or, or love. But there's, I'm still not willing or, or no, I'm willing, but I, I still hold on to the rock. <laughs> mm -hmm. I still hold on to the rock and, and I can't let it go or, or I can't let it go as promptly as I want to. And if I can just maybe ask for help, this is where I often forget now is pausing and just asking the universe to help me <laughs> or of course, there's other people that I can ask for help, but in this context, I think the higher power can come in where it's just a surrender and, oh, I, I really just need to let this go right now, but I can't, I can't for some reason. And that's a shortcoming, I think, in some sense. I also think it's helpful to know what's on the other side of that? What do I want to be doing as opposed to what I'm doing now? Because I think that gets in the way a lot of times. It does for me where I know something's not right, but I don't know what, what it looks like to do the different behavior. And that's maybe where the sponsors and having good sponsorship and learning from others can be useful. I know I didn't really say something specific about step six but that's just a little thought trail i have and i'll end it with one of my lovely teachers would always say prayer is the bridge between longing and belonging and for me this the willingness to let go 
or the willing or, or the sense that something's not right and I need to feel connected is that longing. And then once I can let go of the rock, name the vulnerability, ask somebody for help or my higher power, that's that sense of belonging that I can step into. And prayer, I, I know some people, we talked about it last time, get caught up in the words, but prayer is simply just asking for help or, or for something other than what's happening now. So that's my circular <laughs> comment on that experience. Yeah, I had pulled out as you were talking my, my list of defects, because one of the things that I did as an exercise in my last inventory um, process that I did last year, because when, when the pandemic struck, I got really shooken up as with many people I'm sure in the world did. And uh, I did what I know to do, which is, um, you know, dig into the steps a little bit more. And I thought this would be a really excellent time to do this because my whole department was shaken up, you know, with what was going on in the world, all my insecurities were being sparked. I had no idea how much I, didn't know that all along until the pandemic hit, right? Cause like, I mean, life was good and, you know, I was sober and, you know, it, there was a lot really going great. And then, but I still didn't really understand how still dependent I was on, you know, the way things were, you know, like I really hadn't fostered that real soul dependence on a higher power. And then when everything like, my ability to work and, you know, just be with people, go to meetings, all the things that I did that were part of my normal day-to-day -day life was suddenly pulled out from under my feet and I didn't no longer had those things. And I was just stuck with myself. It really was challenging at first. I remember my fear was really triggered big time. So I did that. I just, um, you know, I had, I had just recently gotten a new sponsor and we were in a different program, working at a different program together. So that was really great. It wasn't like I was doing the same old material all over again. It was brand new material. Um, the step four inventory sheets were brand new. Like everything was kind of, so it was for me, it was almost like being a newcomer all over again and having to relearn the program all over again. And it was really, really fundamentally good for my soul to do that. One of the things was I, I actually had to write out all of my defects. Um, I had never done that before. I wasn't really clear on what they were before. And there's all kinds of really wonderful materials out there. You can, you can Google search defects of character lists and then they'll you know, publish, there's all these published lists of every single defect you can think of. And then I just went through them and just wrote them out of everything that I identified with myself through my, my fourth and my fifth steps. And I found the process of writing them down and making the list of my shortcomings and my defects to have them there so that I could really see them for myself. And, and then again, doing that you know, to the mirror, going to my bathroom mirror and then reading them out loud to myself, looking at myself in the eye and, you know, and saying all these things to myself. So it kind of reinforced it in me found it to be a very good process yeah well any chance you want to read some of those for sure. us i got my list here so yeah I'll read please them all. i think that'd be lovely okay yeah. so um and these were all what i plucked out taken from my fourth step so self-reliance selfishness know-it-all attitude and difficulty asking for help mistrusting i take things far too personally i'm suspicious i often play a victim I'm slothful and procrastinating at times, especially when it comes to spiritual work. I'm still, I can be very slothful. I'm thoughtless. I'm often self-seeking, prideful, can be condescending and sarcastic, envious, dishonest, mainly with myself. I still struggle with self-honesty even to this day. Insecure physically and financially. I can be controlling deceiving and sometimes fake 
you know, because I want to show you only certain parts of myself. Um, fearful, inadequate. I can be judgmental of others, self-righteous, codependent, manipulative, miserly, perfectionistic, self-justifying, cynical, self-rejecting, closed-minded. I'm uh, often in, can be in fantasy, even even to this day, you know. I, and I didn't really understand really what fantasy was in many respects. Um, and pretty much I get it today when I'm not in the present moment of reality, I'm in fantasy. So if, like, for example, if I think you should be doing something differently, Mike, or if you're not working the program that I think that you should be working, then I am in fantasy. And I didn't get that for a long time. Um, anyhow, uh, I'm sexually insecure, uh, often can be other focused, um, negative thinking and self-critical. I can deprive myself of goodness, uh, people pleasing and a martyr, obstinance and stubbornness. Um, I could be very opinionated, prideful, self-important, and I often find myself enabling others. And finally, the last one was I objectify and sexualize others um, as a gay man. That's been a real thing for a long time in my world. And I also go to SLAA and I find that uh, that particular program helps me to focus on areas of concern around intimacy and um, a lot of stuff that I just really wasn't addressing in my A recovery work because the focus is more on substance abuse and recovery from that. And, you know, I find for me, the um, emotional and sexual anorexia that was the undercurrent of my addiction, um, addictions, I really feel for me today is really the, one of the core issues. Is, is the, the deprivation, the, the, um, the inability to appropriately express these fundamental needs, you know, that really got squashed down early as a child, uh, began with me having to hide and not show the world who I really was, because who I was was not good, you know, and, uh, and, you know, there's just a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff that I went through as a child, trauma and different things that inherently made me feel bad about myself, that I wasn't good enough, that I didn't belong. Um, and I just carried this with me all of my life. So various forms of self-deception, you know, that were inherent for so long, you know, that I didn't really understand how much I was carrying this into my life you know, and really, I mean, I say this often, I mean, the world doesn't really ascribe to the principles that we learn in 12-step recovery, you know, I mean, I think in many ways, the 12 steps are contrary to what we're taught to be, to behave in the world, you know, um, and that's unfortunate, I think, in many ways. Uh, you know, I don't want to get that's another yeah. tangent I don't want to get on to. So. <laughs> well, hopefully people can pick up that in sort of um, intuitively or in some sense, it's self-evident the more you learn about the steps, how helpful they can be and how much we're not taught these things in daily life. On that, but I want to pause for a second because I want to shine a light on or honor how sacred what you just did is and, and how we the gift of this program in some sense allows us to do those things and i don't know how many uh, to sit in to sit in front of someone and to say those things out loud for whoever's going to listen to this, it's, it's beautiful. And I was getting 
and had a moment of getting emotional listening to you because it's just so wonderful to be able to one get to a place where we're self-assured enough to be able to look at our shadow there's a lot of talk in pop psychology these days or in a lot of these sort of spiritual self-development communities shadow work we're going to do shadow work i have not seen anything remotely as thorough and, and deep and robust as the 12 steps in terms of doing shadow work and so just for everyone listening and just to say it out loud is how beautiful it is to hear another human being say those things in a way that's honorable and sincere and genuine is beautiful it's so wonderful so thank you for that i wish i had a list like that in front of me now that i could read but i don't (laughs) and um another point i think that's important to note because it might not be so obvious is there's a huge difference between acknowledging our shadow selves right and all these things that we that aren't good in some sense right or unhelpful it's one thing to be able to see them and then to be able to share them out loud in a way that's not self-critical i think is is a a skill i don't know if it's but it it's a a sign of growth or something like that because oftentimes we maybe the first times and this happens in the rooms a lot there's a lot of self-deprecating sharing you know i'm a stupid alcoholic or i'm a self-centered this i'm a and and i think there's a very fine line between that being some sort of avoidance or some sort of um I don't know, there's just something that's not quite, I don't know if it's honorable or genuine about that, but when we can acknowledge our shortcomings in a way that's sincere and honorable, and that comes from a place of strength or self-assuredness, that's just, that's the ticket. I mean, that's where we really start to heal and open up and, and free ourselves. And then being able to share that with others is such a gift. So I just, yeah, I just want to thank you. And one more point is in my, as a therapist, the healing comes from that place so much. It's just it's not we don't necessarily have to do all these great things or, or or make progress in our lives in other ways if we can't dig out that darkness it's very hard to to make spiritual or emotional growth or progress and so that's my little story around that so thank you for reading that list it's beautiful and maybe if you want to add anything to that but then also maybe we should move on to step seven or just tie up step seven into this. Yeah. I mean, thank you, Mike, for saying that. And, uh, you know, it's, I don't know. I see that list as something we all, if at some point or another in our lives touch on, I mean, absolutely. I think there, I think, like I said earlier, I think it's just so ingrained into us, I'll speak about myself, to not show that side, you know, like to not admit, um, to not um, say these things aloud, uh, that kind of keep, it kept me like in the dark for a long time, because you know, I just kept going in circles with certain behaviors and you know, it's, you said the shine the light on it, right? You know, and that's what we do. We shine the light in the darkness of our, of our characters. And that's how we grow. That's how we heal. That's how I grow and heal. I should say, I'll speak in I statements. Um, But unless I'm first 
you know, made aware. Um, and and um, so I can take some action. Like if I don't even know what they are, I can't take actions to correcting them, right? And I think that's really the first part of it is really just identifying what all of these are so I can then take it to step seven. And, uh, and I need help, like, you know, step seven is an action step, you know, and I don't know if you want to start. Yeah, I just, yeah, right before, just to pause there, because I love that you said, and I need help, I think it's important to clarify or almost put, put flags in the ground about we can't do these things alone. And, and I think to be able to get to a place where we can sincerely see those things in us and not run from them and actually see them as a sign of strength and a sense of common humanity. And I'm glad you remind you, you mentioned that because absolutely we share all these things people share them in different ways and they're more prevalent in certain people and situations but we can't do it alone and that's very important to remember i i think i mentioned that last time it took me almost two years to get through a really thorough fourth and fifth step and i had a you know i had a therapist i had a marriage counselor i had a sponsor i had the rooms and that part of us that's so hurt or scared whether it's from addiction and alcoholism or just from difficult lives it really needs to be loved into the open and and i just having a well of emotion pleasant emotion like we have to love ourselves or love each other into a place where it's even possible to see those things or where it's safe enough to see those things. And I, I think, yeah, I wanted to add that. And maybe that ties in a bit to step seven, the principle of humility. It's very difficult to be humble when you're still running around in fear or where, when you can't recognize your inherent vulnerability as just being a human. And I think getting to that place requires that love and that community that I just was mentioning. And then, and then we have the opportunity to practice humility. And I remember the one definition of humility that I like is it's not thinking less of yourself, but it's thinking of yourself less. And maybe just briefly, let's, you know, I should probably read step seven. Um, I think it's humbly asked God to remove our shortcomings. Is that right? I don't, I think that's verbatim, but. I should have it in front of me, which I do not. But yeah, so maybe you said you said step seven is an action step, and and maybe you can kind of walk us through what that's like from your perspective. Yeah. So um, with step seven, initially, um, I remember distinctly doing step seven with my sponsor. I think we did it on our knees together. Um, and that's kind of how I like to do step seven with my sponsees as well. It's something I find it's not a one shot deal. I think initially it is, you know, when we're going through the process uh, and it's huge. Like for me to actually get on my knees and pray with another person, <laughs> that was, weird you know um but it's it's very healing my experience with step seven is you know and i think you said it uh very apropos around what the, the definition of humility is and i i really agree with that that it's it's for me it's it's really seeing myself in the right relation with God and others, right? And 
of my alcoholic mindset, it has been horribly askewed. I was either less than or better than. There was never like a humble, equal playing field. It was either you're better than or you're less than. That's the way it had always been all of my life. Even to this day, you know, even like in work cultures, there is this like you're either better that you have the answers for everything. Like, you know, this is what I have yet to see, especially in the workplace, is, you know, somebody just saying, like, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Um, you know, there's <laughs> always like this air that you're just supposed to know things and you're supposed to have the answers and you're supposed to go out and find it if you don't know it. And 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 I think a lot of times too, um, yeah, I don't even want to get into that, but uh, it, it's, I think, again, my point is, is it's really in, in, in bred into, into many of us, this idea that, you know, this in it, like that we don't ask for help, you know, that I don't reach outside of my own limited resources or what my own mind is telling me to be true. Um, I still falter with that to this day. It's something that's it's so entrenched in my thinking and my neural pathways, you know, really like often, when do I really reach out for help? Well, when my self-reliance doesn't work anymore, when I haven't really thought it all out through and I've got no answer for myself anymore, that's usually rather than just reaching out and, and asking for help right from the get-go, um, still very difficult for me to do. Um, in relationship to the list that I just read, a lot of those inherent shortcomings and defects of mine really need support of, of others to see me. You know, I need to be transparent with it. Um, my life was always a life of hiding. It was always to put on the veneer of perfection and to show you a certain side of myself, not to really show you everything. And so, you know, doing this process with a sponsor where I've actually, with some person I confided all of this into and really put it out there, well, that's a good process because then it holds me accountable. And then it helps somebody to reflect back to me, you know, areas that I want to work on. If I'm not really exposing that to you, then I'm still hiding that and then I'm not gonna get well, right? So unless I really take that risk and confide it with people and let, you know, and that's my experience of step seven is just putting it out there to a higher power. So anything beyond myself, it doesn't have to actually be the pie in the sky. It can be a therapist, it can be friends, it can be um, a peer support group that I belong to. Um, there's um, all kinds of groups like there's a steel on steel that is becoming quite popular where there are like accountability recovery groups of of um, you know peers right they're all in sort of and they they challenge each other right so you you know there's all kinds of methods in doing this i think what it's doing is it's it's helping me to grow it's challenging me to move outside of the familiar and what I've always been doing and to help me grow, you know, and to overcome self-centeredness, because I really think that that's the whole process of recovery is, is learning to overcome selfishness and self-centeredness. The big book speaks to that specifically that those are the, the sort of core, you know, root of my troubles, right? And off from it comes all this other stuff um other forms of of self but you know i feel like it's all manifests of self in some degree or another and i need help with that because if i'm left to my own devices i'm just going to continue to do what i've always done one of the mantras that was really important to me especially in my early recovery um, i used to say it to myself a lot is when i always do what i've always done then I'll continue to always get what I've always gotten. And, you know, that just reminded me that I need to change. This is a, a process of change and I'm deeply afraid to change, you know, even, even now, like it doesn't come easy, even though 
I'm much more experienced at the process of change because I look behind me and I can see there's been huge growth from when I first entered the rooms on August 1st, 1998, totally, completely different than the way that I am today. So it's been an ongoing journey of, of change for me. Um, and it's been good in many, mostly. I mean, there's been some bumps along the road, but for the most part, it's been a good process, you know? And, uh, but yet, you know, even though I know this inside, I still resist it. You know, I still like balk at it sometimes. It's like, you know, I remember when I got promoted at work and I, it was going to be a totally different job that I was going to do. And I remember like really grateful that I got the promotion. But then when I went home and sat and thought about it and I'm like, oh my God, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> you know, and like I was in all this fear and worry and, you know, uh, how am I going to do this? And it's like, well, it was the same. Like I remember when I got sober, I didn't know how to do sobriety. I didn't know how to live sober. All I knew how to do was live like an addict and steal and lie and manipulate and all the things that I did. And, you know, I had to start somewhere and, you know, people were there to guide me, you know? And I think the biggest thing was just really putting myself out there, taking risks, asking for help, you know, which really is what, for me, what is what step seven is. And so today, you know, um, I still try to keep step seven close to me. Um, I begin my day every morning by asking for help with another sober day. And just, you know, making this conscious reminder that I need, I need you with me, you know, I need your help, you know, help me to go out and fit in right now, you know, just to disclose a little personal, you know, I've been um, recently diagnosed with, uh, with um, cancer, and it's a prostate cancer, and it's a very treatable cancer, but still it's cancer, you know, and, uh, you know, it's, you know, sparking other areas of concern inside of me but you know like I find for me the the ability to just get still and get quiet and be with my higher power and just sort of take that time especially in the mornings just to sort of have that devotion and to like remember you know I'm not doing this alone that I've always got my higher power with me you know and that whatever I'm led to, I'll be led through. And I just have to keep that in the forefront. And it's when I try to just do things by myself or not asking for help. And the amount of support that has come through, and like I've just been open and honest with people, sharing my journey, letting people know what's going on, sharing it in the rooms. The outpour of support and love and sincerity that's come from people it's been at times very overwhelming I didn't have to tell people you know I could just like and I know lots of people they would rather not say anything about what they're going through and just because they don't want people to treat them any differently well I don't really want people to treat me any differently either but I think I think in the process of me going through some potentially challenging times ahead I need to let people know I might need your help, you know, and, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that, you know, and we're here to help each other. Right. So, um, yeah, so, um, step seven is, uh, still very much for me, a work in progress. Um, you know, uh, seeing helping me to see me the way you see me like that's kind of the intention of my prayer help me to see me the way you see me you know so if my higher power sees me as divine and loving and, you know perfect in every way not in a sort of an egotistical way but just like I'm divine and perfect as I've been created you know, but yet for whatever reason, I tend to focus in on my flaws and what's not good enough and all this crap. It's like, oh yeah, let's do an inventory of everything that's right about ourselves. Like how often do we do that? You know, <laughs> it's always about what's wrong with me. Oh, my belly's a little big or this or that or whatever, you know. Anyhow, 
Yeah, that's really Am nice. I... <laughs> yeah, it's, no, it's just so nice to sit and listen. Okay, I'm going to, before we move on to step eight here, I'm just going to read a bit more from Drop the Rock. Okay, this is page 140. The 12 step way of life is humble, but not in any way meek. The picture many of us have of a humble person is someone afraid of his or her own shadow, whose self-image is so low that this person is afraid to stand up for him or herself. We learn that this image of humility is not what is meant in the program. We realize that the people who have stayed abstinent for some time practice a degree of humility that was foreign to them prior to recovery. For those who have made progress in their program, humility is simply a clear recognition of what and who they are. They have gotten down to their own right size. Humility is understanding that they're worthwhile. It's the middle ground between the extremes of grandiosity and intense shame. They have a sincere desire to be and become the best they can be. Today, we remember that humility is not being meek. It is being our true selves. Humility for us means staying our right size and remembering we are as humble as we are grateful. For our definition, we will use this idea from Sam Shoemaker. Humility equals gratitude. Humility is an attitude as such it must be practiced to be maintained, and it must become a discipline to be developed, just like every other attitude. In developing humility, we are faced once again with an active surrender. In asking God to remove our shortcomings, we must move and act in a manner that reflects our willingness and surrender. To do this requires spiritual values, service, perspective beyond our addiction to alcohol, drugs, food, sex, and so on, to the addictive nature of our lives, asking through prayer and being willing to receive through humility, trust slash asking for help, overcoming fear, understanding and trusting the process, dealing with stress, responsibility slash action, slash action, and solution-focused thinking. I'm going to pause with that. I think that sums it up pretty nicely. I really like that. Yeah. Well, whoever wrote this book, <laughs> I know there's some authors, but that's wonderful. Okay. And we could obviously go on and on. So let's just jump into step eight, I guess. Um, do you have, oh, I got it. Here we go. Okay, so made a list. So step eight, everybody. The principle is love or sometimes it's responsibility or step nine's responsibility. I think I've seen, is it normally love or responsibility, I guess, depending on whose list you look at. Okay, made a list of all the persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. You wanna take it from there? <laughs> yeah, so um, there's, I uh, just wanted to say about step seven, there's an associated prayer that's out of the big book. Um, and a lot of times uh, what's done is, is, you know, that prayer, you know, my, my creator, I am willing that you should now have all of me, good and bad. I pray that you now remove from me every single defect of character which stands in the way of my useful, usefulness to you and my fellows. Grant me strength as I go from here to do your bidding. Um, and that's um, that's the sort of the standard prayer that you know many of us use um, together. You know, and then step eight. Uh, is immediately followed, uh, I think it's important. How I understand it today is like all these steps are taken in succession 
in, in a very close proximity of time because every action that we take opens us up for more action, right? And, or fear if left too long. Um, so my experience has been, it's best to do this stuff all very quickly. So once I've taken step seven and done the step seven prayer, then I immediately get my pen and paper out and then I write down all my list. And I think a lot of the list that comes uh, on my eighth step, a lot of it will be extracted out of my fourth step. Um, a lot of the things that I put there but also like the step suggests that I make a list of all people I have harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Um, and that, that list is important, um, you know, ransacking my memory, going over my history of all the various forms of harms done to others. I think this is an important step too, because the way I understand addiction and alcoholism is for me, it was a lot of it was infused with guilt. I guess somewhere along the line in early childhood, I inherited the belief of I was bad, I wasn't good enough. Um, this guilt settled in, and um, I started to to go awry. You know, there were just a lot of things that were starting to happen, and and I found the process of sitting down and writing out the list deeply spiritual and and just getting it and it 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 kind of moved my heart you know and uh, yes the, the principle is love uh, uh in my notes here it says some say forgiveness uh i i can concur with both of them because i remember distinctly feeling in my heart as i was writing it all out something was shifting inside of me specifically right after doing step seven and then moving into step eight, where I actually finally took ownership for my part in things. And then, because like, like I said before, I was such a victim, you know, and I had so much hurt inside of me over a lot of things that that was blocking me and understanding that I had a part in all of this. Um, a lot of it was my part in hanging on you know, or replaying the psychology of the hurt in my life, which I didn't understand for a lot of it. Um, this victimized way of thinking that, um, and, it, and it just kind of perpetuated this life experience in me. And uh, it, it's, it's difficult, difficult to describe, but it was just, it was calling upon this experience and it was just like a, like a magnet. And so when I finally kind of understood that I was a co-creator in a lot of this drama of my life, helped me to open me up. Um, and, but, you know, the important thing is that I get the list done and I put everybody on there and become willing to make amends to them all. And, you know, it doesn't say in that part of the step that we actually do amends, because I think a lot of times where people get stuck in that step is they think, oh my God, I can't go to that person, you know, for whatever reason. And that's not what it's asking us to do. It's just asking us for now to put it on paper and just forget about it. Um, we just become willing to make amends, right? And that's the important part of it. And, you know, there were some people on that list for me that were very, very difficult, you know, that I just could not ever see myself ever even speaking to, you know, because there was just such deep, passionate resentment there, you know? And, uh, um, you know, and so like the, the, the categories that I learned is like we make maybe three lists, the list of like, no, never, and then the list of maybe, um, and then the, the list of I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, the, the, the easier ones, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I found like as I started doing the immense process, um, which is a little bit after that, but I'm, the only reason why I'm speaking about it is those, those 
ones that were on the no never then started to move over into the well you know maybe i will you know type of thing so but that's that's how a lot of people do their lists as they divide it into three columns and they just put the people that you know, there's no never, or there's an impossibility, like they might be dead, for example, or in a completely different part of the world, or have lost complete touch with them. You haven't seen them in years, but you know, but you never know, like what opportunities might present themselves. But yeah, this is a very important step. Um, I didn't really understand the importance of it. Um, you know, and in, in, in the fact of like. The importance of writing it out um, and, and getting all the people that and so the other part too about the harm is like understanding what the harm was right and I think that part of it I need to consult with my sponsor and um, and then I know like in some respects what I thought was harm was actually not harm you know or I didn't really need to actually like it's I think it's just important to sort of put it out on paper and then consult with your sponsor and then kind of talk about it and see yeah 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 I I think my first one of my reactions to that amends process was I think it gets very strong in people in the beginning is, oh my God, I'm no longer, or, or I'm not using anymore. I'm starting to feel better. I need to go shout on the mountaintops <laughs> that I'm free and that I got to fix all these past harms and bad things I did. And I'm just going to tidy it all up all in this moment which is, it's sort of a, a naive, I, I think there's something genuine about it, but it's very naive and sort of a little bit self-serving. And as we've mentioned with a lot of the other things, we, the steps are in order for a reason and if we go through them thoroughly, thoroughly and fearlessly with the help of others, we get to a place where we can start to write down or, or acknowledge all the things that we probably couldn't have seen had we not gone through the, that process. And I, I like that you said step eight, although it is connected to step nine, has to be done in isolation first. Just don't worry about, I love, I think you said something like that person, no way, you know, or that situation, hell no, I'm not going back to revisit that one. All we got to do is just get it all onto paper first. And in those categories, you know, the never, the maybe, and the yes, however we do it in some sense, we just have to do it. And then I think there's a ton of wisdom in step nine on how to go through with it, which maybe we, we all get to. But that step eight... you mentioned this earlier there's something obviously we're, we're in some sense we're preaching to the choir or we're biased because we these principles and steps have been so important in our lives even as a psychotherapist I, I i still don't see this type of wisdom and thoroughness in relationship to the specific things we're trying to learn and do anywhere else in the psychotherapeutic literature or even in other spiritual practices. So there is something really freeing about the step eight process. Because I think maybe even up until step eight, it's very much an internal house cleaning. 
it's an internal yeah I, I guess that's the best way to say it or the only way that's coming to me now and then we're ready to pivot to to others we, we've really changed and now it's time to step up i guess and and see if we can carry this into into our relationship with other people and that's probably i'll just stop with that and maybe i don't know if you think there's more to add or if we should go into step nine or what you think um do we have time or is... yeah I don't know. that's a good question yeah, yeah. yeah. there was thing it in the feels back like it was like yeah feels like a good place to i agree, pause I, for agree. This. And then I agree you're right it, it it then moves in so yeah you're right it it is largely a house cleaning right and so now yeah. the step nine is the process in which we go out into the world and and repair our relationship our broken relationships right so yeah um, i've heard it said uh you know steps one two and three are getting right uh what is it right with self right with god and then right with others right is that how it goes right with self uh right with god um right with, i don't know something, yeah, something like that, that. But, yeah but yeah the the uh the latter three um four steps are really about, you know, carrying it out into the world and, and, and repairing the wreckage and, and keeping our house clean. Right. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a good idea. We'll pause. There it is. Five. Okay. Yeah. Five. It doesn't matter what to other people, it doesn't matter the time, but we, Tony was gracious. I had a meltdown, lost my keys, was late to get here. So Tony's been very patient and gracious with his time. So again, thank you, Tony. And this has been so beautiful. And I, I look forward to continuing it.